I'm here again to try and discuss with you another issue that arises from time to time pertaining to consolidations. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how to calculate and consolidate a company whereby the parent company has only indirect control. Let's get started. So here's what I mean by indirect control. Parent owns 75% of direct corporation and 40% of indirect corporation. Had that been the end of it, parent would consolidate direct and use the equity method to account for indirect. But here's the rub. Direct Corporation acquired a 40% block of indirect corporation shares this year. But by virtue of parent corporation having the ability to vote both blocks of shares, the 40% it owns in indirect, as well as the other 40% that it controls through direct corporation, parent now controls indirect corporation, albeit indirectly, pardon the pun. Where control exists, so does consolidation. The principles of consolidation that we have discussed in previous lessons still hold. In a consolidated entity, you start by combining all the sets of financial statements and then go about your eliminations of the intercompany activity within the elimination zone as well as those amortizations of the purchase price differentials. However, because there are both direct and indirect earnings for a parent, you need to go about the calculation of consolidated net earnings and the parent's allocation of those earnings sequentially as depicted in this diagram. So directionally, we're going to do all of the same things we've already talked about However, practically speaking, we're going to start at the bottom of the organizational chart. That is, with indirect corporation, and work our way back up to a parent corporation. Now let's look at an example to see what this looks like. Now here is the actual math behind the previous slide's representation. And we're going to work through the example in just a second. But I want to just start with noticing how we have the three companies across the top, and the results are getting combined. In the first section, we do all of the consolidation entries as we normally would for the eliminations and the amortization of the purchase price differentials. I'm going to leave the gain on the revaluation until we get to the actual example. This gives us a line on our schedule that's been noted as the consolidated net income. The bottom half of this schedule is useful to figure out the non-controlling interest allocations of that consolidated income. By starting with indirect corporation, we allocate its equity earnings to parent and direct corporations for each of their respective 40% interests. The $3,640 represents a portion of the non-controlling interest. Next we look at the direct corporation and allocate its equity earnings, being the 75% to the parent and the remaining 25% to the non-controlling interest of direct corporation. Note that a portion of these earnings actually include those that were allocated by indirect corporation. So the non-controlling interest allocation for direct corporation is $13,478. And for the consolidated entity, the allocation to non-controlling interest is $17,118, leaving $172,075 as the parent's allocation of consolidated net income. Do you see how this process works in reverse, working from the bottom of the organizational chart up to the parent? So now let's dive into a detailed example. Okay, so here's our example. We have extracts from our Year 7 financial statements prior to the equity method journal entries presented here for each of parent corporation, direct corporation, and indirect corporation. So you can see the respective assets and liabilities, as well as the shareholders equity, as well as the net income for each of the legal entities. The acquisition information is presented here. Parent acquired indirect corporation on January 1st of year four. And at that time, the negative purchase price differential on the 40% interest was $10,000, all allocated to equipment with a 10-year economic life. In year six, 
Parent acquired its 75% interest in direct corporation. The purchase price differential at that time was $40,000 relating to a building and $53,333 to patents with an eight-year life. And then finally, uh, on January 1st of year seven this year, for $92,000, Direct Corporation acquired its 40% uh, interest in Indirect Corporation. And there was no purchase price differential on this acquisition. And to make this example a little bit more realistic, let's just sprinkle in some intercompany transactions and balances. Inventory in Direct Corporation purchased from Parent Corporation, in other words, a P to S transaction, contained profit of $2,400. Inventory of parent corporation purchased from indirect corporation contains profit of $3,000. In other words, an S to P transaction. Parent owes $20,000 to indirect corporation. Indirect corporation owes $2,000 to parent. And we have a 40% tax rate. Here's what we want to calculate in this video. What is the non-controlling interest of the consolidated net income? As well as what are the consolidated retained earnings statement? as well as redrafting the consolidated balance sheet. Let's start with the acquisition that happened this year. That is, Direct's acquisition of Indirect Corporation on January 1st for $92,000. Now the importance of this acquisition was that when combined with the 40% that Parent Corporation already owned, those combined blocks gave parent corporation control over indirect corporation. So at this point in time, we need to recalculate a purchase price differential. Now they've indicated that we do not have any differences, which is another way of saying that the fair value of the assets and liabilities reflects the book value of assets and liabilities. However, with the acquisition of control of indirect corporation, there is one item that we need to be concerned with. That is parent corporation's valuation of its existing investment in its 40% block in indirect corporation. Now upon the acquisition of control, as you'll remember from a prior lesson, parent will adjust its cost base of its investment to reflect the fair value. And since direct corporation just paid $92,000 for its 40% stake, this will result in a $7,000 gain that will get flushed through the income statement. Note that all of the prior purchase price differential that the parent was amortizing against its equity earnings will now go away. That's our first adjustment. Now let's move on and look at calculating our purchase price differential amortization schedules. Now since we did not have a purchase price differential on the acquisition of control of indirect corporation, there's no schedule to prepare. There's no fair value increments to amortize or reverse. However, we still need to be concerned with and track the continuity of the purchase price acquisition differential of parents acquisition of direct corporation in year six. So you can see that we have to track the building and the patents. And the amounts have been updated and reflected here. And we'll take amortization of $8,667 in year seven. Next, we need to analyze the intercompany transactions that were provided to us. We have some intercompany profits and ending inventory that will need to be eliminated. We have the parent to direct and the indirect to the parent transactions. So we've noted the gross profits need to be eliminated from the inventory as well as the deferred taxes that need to be set up. So now we're at a point where we can calculate the consolidated net income. We start with the net income of each of the three companies. And to that, we make each of our adjustments for consolidation purposes. First, we have the gain on the revaluation of the block of shares in indirect corporation upon the acquisition of control. Next, we have the amortization of the purchase price discrepancy relating to parents' investment in direct corporation. Next, we have to eliminate the profit and ending inventory on intercompany transactions which leaves us with consolidated net income. Now we need to go through and figure out how much of that net income gets allocated to the non-controlling interest and how much gets allocated to the common shares of parent corporation. If you recall from the comments at the outset of the presentation, you will start with indirect corporation and you will allocate its income to its respective owners. 
40% being allocated to direct, 40% being allocated to parent in the amounts of $7,280. This leaves us with a residual amount of income in indirect corporation that gets attributed to the non-controlling interest in the amount of $3,640. Now we go to direct corporation and do the same thing by allocating 75% of its earnings to parent corporation. This leaves an additional residual of $13,478 that gets attributed to the non-controlling interest. And what is left over, the $172,075, is what is allocated to the parent. We now have enough information to prepare our retained earnings statement. The balance at the beginning of the year of $314,250 comes from the parent's retained earnings. Our net income allocated to the common shareholders of parent corporation comes from the continuity schedule we just prepared. And then finally, the dividends paid are the dividends paid by the parent during the year. Let's just take a look and prepare a quick consolidation of the non-controlling interest that will show up on the balance sheet. To do so, we'll have to look at the shareholders' equity balance of both indirect corporation and direct. So we look at the indirect corporation and we see that they have $250,000 less the profit in closing inventory leaving $248,000 of which 20% belongs to the non-controlling interest. Next we look at the shareholders equity of direct corporation. It has common shares of $400,000, retained earnings at the beginning of the year of $61,000, net income before the equity pickup of $53,300, the equity pickup represents the amounts picked up from indirect corporation that we determined above of 7280 We also have to include the unamortized purchase price differential schedule, which is the $76,000, which comes from above. And then we finally take a proportion that belongs to the non-controlling interest, giving us an additional 149000 and then finally, direct corporation has outstanding preferred shares in the amount of 50000 And this amount comes from the preferred shares represented on direct company's balance sheet. So we now know that the non-controlling interest that should be represented on the balance sheet will be $249,535. We've now covered off the first two items. What we have left is preparing a consolidated balance sheet for the three companies. So to do this, let's start by just simply combining our accounts across the three companies. Next, let's post our consolidation adjustments. We'll start by eliminating the intercompany balances, and that being the $20,000 and the $2,000 that is due between the various companies. Our next adjustment eliminates the profit and ending inventory in the parent to direct transaction, which comes from right over here. And then we need to make adjustments that pertain to eliminating our subsidiary accounts. So we need to eliminate the investments in indirect corporation. We need to eliminate the investment in direct corporation. We need to adjust the property plan equipment and the patents in direct corporation for the purchase price differential. We need to eliminate the preference shares as these will be included in non-controlling interest. We need to eliminate the common shares in both direct company and indirect company. I'll come back and deal with non-controlling interest in a moment. We need to eliminate the retained earnings of both direct and indirect corporation as at the beginning of the year. We need to reflect the gain on the acquisition of control of indirect corporation. And then we have our other items that we identified through the equity pickup, which I've just separated into another column here to separately identify these amounts. You'll recall that we need to eliminate the intercompany profit and ending inventory that's being held by direct corporation and the associated deferred taxes. Next, we have to record the pickup of the income of our subsidiaries and eliminate their income from our numbers. This number is made up of the elimination of the 55,000 and the 20,000 and adds in our allocation that we determined earlier, the 7,000 and the 40,000 to give us a net amount of 27,585. And then finally, we also have to pick up the non-controlling interest portion, the 17118 The allocation of the income attributed to the non-controlling interest from both direct corporation 
an indirect corporation. And then finally, we can determine the amount of our non-controlling interest that needs to be reported. And we earlier prepared a reconciliation that calculated that the balance in this account should be 249,534, as you'll recall from our schedule below, which means that the balance of non-controlling interest at the beginning of the year must have been $232,416. We now have a consolidated balance sheet and a consolidated net income calculated. You can see that the process of going through and preparing a consolidation when we have indirect subsidiary holdings has a lot of similarities to the process that we've talked about all along. The only thing different is the calculation and the attribution of income from those lowest level subsidiaries up through the chain of ownership to the parent corporation. I hope that makes sense. So until next time, don't stop to get to the top. When you get to the top, don't stop.